Okay, so hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Yvonne Valencourt. I am the director of the Nantucket Field Station. We are a facility of UMass Boston and managed by the School for the Environment. Um, we are partners with Nantucket Conservation Foundation, who owns our land out here at the field station on Nantucket Island. And today, um, we welcome you and are so thrilled that you're joining us to hear from Krill Carson. Uh, Carol Carson is here um, with her crew to talk to us about her work. And um, I will let her uh, introduce herself and, and tell you all about what she does. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming everyone. It's more like family than anything else. We have Billy Joe, we have Danny, we have Deliska. This is part of our team. And uh, we are a volunteer nonprofit based in Southeastern Mass. And we're very happy to be here. You guys have been wonderful uh, with us in terms of supporting the work that we do with rescuing and researching marine wildlife. And it's hard for us to get over here on that ferry, a little pricey. So it's really nice to have friends. <laughs> on the other side. So we're gonna talk about a number of different organisms that we're looking at, mm -hmm, maybe. Not sure why it's not going. Maybe you I think I just have to click it there, a little different. So we're an all volunteer group and we started with a sighting network for basking sharks, ocean sunfish and uh, using the community to help us out. We also do a lot of marine mammal work. As my name implies, I'm a whale biologist. So it's really fun to continue with that theme. And then we do internships for high school and college students. We think it's very important to train the next generation of students. And we have a Diamondback Terrapin project. Danny's our director of the Diamondback Terrapin project in Marion, Wareham, Mattapoisett. So we're kind of animal oriented and we go pretty much year round. Our only downtime is in February, March when nothing's really happening too much in the field. We started with a community sighting network for two very big, unusual looking fish that we don't really know much about. And so we were asking people to report their sightings. These fish are only on the surface when they want to be. Oh, it's just going to be difficult. And so it's really important to have a sighting network where anybody who's walking a beach or has their own boat, if they could spend a few minutes and give us some information, date, time, general location, GPS position, very helpful for us to learn more about the biology and the behavior and the ecology of these two big fish. So we have online places where people can go to report. What we didn't expect is this. No one told me this was gonna happen. It's not fair. So we started getting phone calls in the fall. I have a stranded ocean sunfish. What do I do? I don't know. I'm a whale biologist. I don't know what to do here. And I've been walking the beaches on the Cape since 1980 and I don't remember this. So, you know, we never say no, we respond. So we were all driving down to the Cape trying to figure out why these animals were stranding live and dead. We thought maybe in the beginning in 2008, it was maybe just a fluke, but these strandings are annual, start happening in the early fall, continuing into early winter. So if you go to the website, Neb Shark website, we have two websites. This one is focused on our community sighting network. We have lots of fun things to get this information out in terms of making it easy and convenient for people to report their sightings, but also to get them involved as a community and helping out one another, which I think is really important. Now, this is our home. This is the Gulf of Maine. And in the Gulf of Maine, it's a huge body of water where the animals can move to feed throughout the spring, summer, and fall. But again, we're only dealing most of the work that we're doing around the Cape Cod area. So the whales, the seabirds, the ocean sunfish, the seals, they're all moving throughout this huge area, trying to find the most productive waters. But most of the research is done along the shoreline because you know research boat time is very expensive. And so we don't really know a lot. One of the problems that we had is Cape Cod. Cape Cod is in the way and it forms this huge hook. And so as the animals are feeding during the spring and summer, everything's good, getting fat, have very happy. But then as it starts to move into the fall, water temperatures are cooling. These animals need to head south, many of these animals. And so 
you know, Cape, uh, Cape Cod is jutting 60 miles into the Atlantic Ocean. If they miss that clear shot down to the Caribbean off Race Point, they're going to get funneled 20 miles into Cape Cod Bay. And of course, they're going to hit Barnstable and they're going to be like, what? And then they're going to start to move up along the shoreline. And a lot of our strandings are in Wellfleet, and you can see why. It's a nice deep opening to the harbor, leads them right into the shallow water. And it's a very long harbor. It's about four and a half miles. So 70% of our ocean sunfish strandings are in Wellfleet Harbor. But these are live health, healthy fish in the wrong place at the wrong time. But sea turtles are stranding now. We have two torpedo rays stranding. As I was trying to get down here on the ferry, I'm taking calls. They have one got rescued, the other one came up dead. Trigger fish, seabirds, sea ducks, everything's getting kind of stuck in the arm of the cape. Not only is Wellfleet an issue, so we have the hook of the cape. That's the first big hook. We have another hook, which is Great Island and Wellfleet Harbor. But even if they miss that, they have a third hook, which is Long Point at the tip of the Cape from Provincetown. So it's very difficult to navigate out of this area. Even the smart animals, the dolphins and the porpoises have a hard time figuring it out. So strandings in New England, as you know, can occur for a number of different reasons. Can be because of entrapments in shallow tidal areas, the water goes out, there's the animal left high and dry. Vessel strikes, getting entangled in fishing gear, wind and current issues, and of course this time of the year, as the temperatures really drop below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, we're dealing with animals that are cold shocked or cold stunned. So here's off of Brewster, these are the tidal flats. When the tide goes out, you can have up to two, three miles of flats. It's very hard for any animal to navigate in that. Many strandings occur along those flats. Here are two ocean sunfish. The one on the left got hit by a boat. You can see the prop scars. And the other fish on the right probably got caught in some kind of fishing gear. So this can happen with any of the animals. This is a wind and current issue. This is Ranger Megan. She's a Coast Guard uh, beach ranger. She called me. I had never met her. She said, I have an ocean sunfish stranding on the outside of the cape. The wind and the current's just pushing this fish onto the beach. What do I do? And I said, do you have a strap in your truck? And she said, yes. And she got three people who were walking by to help her. And it took them three or four tries to get this fish back into the surf and then back through it and out into deep water. So these are always problems that all different animals can have. And this time of the year, we're dealing with animals that are cold shocked or cold stunned. And so we're dealing with animals that are not functioning at normal capacity. Now for the sea turtles, the New England Aquarium and the National Marine Life Center, working with Mass Audubon and NOAA, and will basically take these animals and rehab them and release after about nine to 12 months of rehab. But nobody wants an ocean sunfish. I begged the aquarium to take just one for their big tank, but they said no. So we are dealing with animals that really uh, are in bad shape and we will still rescue them and push them back in the water, but they'll come back up. So for ocean sunfish, the classification scheme is changing, but we're mainly dealing with the common mola in this area. But a couple of years ago, we had one of the first shark tail moles, I'll show you that, strand in Wellfleet. And so this is a cosmopolitan species found in all oceans. As you can see on the map, all the red areas are hot spots for ocean sunfish, very coastal, spend a lot of time in high latitudes, very productive waters feeding throughout the spring, summer, and fall. And then because they cannot tolerate prolonged cold temperatures, will migrate south. And they really don't have any predators once they get to a certain size. You'll see why they have um, a little bit of an armor to them. So nothing really goes after them. We don't know much about them. They're not fished. They're not uh, evaluated very often. We're not sure about the exact population status worldwide, but the IUCN does think that their numbers are decreasing. So that is a bit of a concern. They are really big when they become adults. Luckily, we don't have adult stranding in our part of the world, thank goodness, because I'm not quite sure how to rescue that. Uh, but they're really cute when they're uh, little fries. They're about the size of a pea. They have all these great little spikies coming out of them. And as they grow into that big, beautiful fish, they uh, absorb those spikes. So they're really unusual fish. 
The adults are said to mainly eat jellyfish, and it's incredible that something of this size and weight can make a living on jellyfish. But here's a video. This is an ocean sunfish that was next to the whale watching boat when we were offshore. You can see this animal spending a lot of time on their side. And I think because they're deep divers and they can only deal with cold temperatures for a short period of time, they'll dive at depths to feed and then they're gonna come up and try to warm up. So they're exposing most of their body to the sun and they seem a little bit out of it. And after about five, 10 minutes, they kind of shake it off and they'll orientate correctly and then they'll swim away. They're very curious. People are always telling me when they report a sighting that the fish came over to the boat, swam around the boat, checked him out, went people watching. And that's always fun to hear. Uh, they really are gentle giants. But this animal will eventually get its act together. You can see it's got some unique pigmentation pattern, but also a scar from hitting something, a rope, a wire. Uh, I don't think that's a prop scar. It could be, it's a bit curved. And now the fish is kind of waking up and it's gonna start to orientate correctly. They swim very interesting. They use the tall dorsal fin and the very long anal fin, and they oscillate those fins to swim. And there he goes. And then the tail, which is called the clavis, is just used as a rudder. These are powerful swimmers, unless they're cold stunned. They are very strong swimmers. So here's an underwater uh, video. A friend of mine, John Chisholm, who works with Greg Skomal, uh, took, they were off of Monomoy. They had just gotten a new GoPro years ago and they were looking for basking sharks, but they saw an ocean sunfish and they snuck up on them in the boat, put the GoPro down in the water. And what I love about this video is that you can see how turbid, how productive our cold waters are. And the visibility is maybe 10, 20 feet, but it's because of all the productivity, all the plankton that's suspended in the water column. And this animal could have swum away, but he's very curious coming right over to the boat, looking right at that GoPro in the water. You can see how it's moving with its dorsal and anal fin. You can see the small pectoral fin just fluttering around, water coming in the mouth, going over the gills hidden under the cheeks, and then out that hole, the operculum, right in front of the fin. And the fish is gonna come right over to the camera and get its camera moment. Hello. <laughs> How can you say no to that? And that eye is about the size of a grapefruit. Well, maybe not grapefruit, maybe an orange. And off he goes. And so they really are quite handsome, I think, and they are covered in parasites. This is normal. I used to think that all the wounds that you saw on an ocean sunfish was because the animal was sick. And I realized that those wounds, I think, are created by the parasites. So they usually have parasites around the mouth. They have parasites in front of the dorsal fin and the anal fin, and they have parasites on the clavis. They have probably have seen about five or six different kinds of external parasites, and they have lots of parasites inside the body. They're said to have the highest number of parasites of any fish. Now, there has been some tagging studies. Blair, were you involved in this at all? No, when they were tagging, I'm not quite sure who they used as a boat. But um, they were, uh, in, uh, Dr. Inga Potter, who was uh, up in New Hampshire, was tagging ocean sunfish off Nantucket and the Cape. And they tagged over 30 fish and they're using these pop-up archival tags. Now you would never use this on a whale. This is something that you would use on a fish. They're expensive, they're about $3,000. They record just three bits of information. They record water depth, water temperature, light levels. And then they hold that data, even if the fish is at the surface, they don't transmit. The little computer inside holds the data until it's been programmed to send a current through the wire and burn off and then it floats up to the surface and then it transmits the data that it's been holding to an Argus satellite and then that gets to the researcher. But from those three bits of information, they have programs where they can plot a lot of information, pull out a lot of good information. And you can see this is the typical path that these animals made uh, in the fall. And she's basically tagging off the Cape. So they're not gonna get stuck in Cape Cod like the ones we're dealing with right now. But this is a animal that cannot withstand prolonged cold temperatures. So it's trying to head into warmer waters, which is very important. And here's some of the dive profiles that they pulled off, the data they pulled off the tags. 
These animals were spending 30% of their time in the top 10 meters of the water column, 80% of their time in the top 200 meters, but the maximum diving depth on the tags was over 844 meters, which is what? Times three to over 2,500 feet, right? Mm -hmm. So these are deep divers. They're going down eating jellyfish and then getting cold and then coming back up. So it makes sense what we're seeing in the summer. They also looked at temperature preferences. And you can see they have a very narrow temperature preference, six degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius, which is 42 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Anything after that, high or low, they're not gonna function very well. So they're gonna move. They're gonna do a lot of behavioral changes to stay within that temp, uh, temperature range. They're either gonna move north or south, high latitude, low latitude, or they're gonna move up and down in the water column. So it's very interesting the behaviors that they're doing. Now, a few years ago, Kunameset Farm Foundation contacted me. They had a couple extra sea turtle satellite tags. Now these are more expensive, probably $5,000. They do report uh, the position and other information of the animal as soon as the tag hits the surface. And so they asked if I would like to go out with them and tag ocean sunfish. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and so now this is not an appropriate tag for an ocean sunfish. It's a little bulky. It's on a tether and you basically get next to the fish and just basically anchor the tether into the animal and then it floats next to the fish. And what's really interesting is the data they got back. Both fish were tagged in September and they were both able to get out of Cape Cod Bay, which is good because a lot of people are like, you're wasting your time. If they're stuck in Cape Cod Bay, they're stuck and they're never going to get out. But that's not true for both of these fish. So we have a sample size of two. That's it, but that's what we got. Now, of course, this fish was tagged off of um, Brewster. This fish was tagged off Wellfleet. Neither one of them crossed the Cape, but <laughs> you know, the satellite information isn't 100% accurate. They probably both went around. One of them, after it was tagged in September, went up to Canadian waters and was feeding. The other one came down and started feeding along this edge, this counter edge in uh, Nantucket, in this area, Nantucket Sound, and then in the channel. And then both of the tags quit, and we think they probably got pulled off because it's not an appropriate tag for them. We hope the animals didn't die, but um, it was really interesting to see what data you could get from satellite tags. So they're very uh, unusual. We don't really understand much about their movements and distribution. We don't have that kind of money, and so all we can buy are the small passive tags. And we have a couple fishermen right now trying to tag them and they're doing better than we are. But when we rescue them in Wellfleet and on the Cape, we really should be tagging the live animals to see how we're doing. And every time we try to tag them, we're breaking the metal poles and we're you know, doing this and doing that and the fish don't like it. So we haven't figured out a way to safely tag a live sunfish. So if the animals are in shallow water and they need to be rescued because we have a lot of tidal areas, in just a few hours, both of these areas are gonna be high and dry, and this is a healthy fish in the wrong place at the wrong time. So we'll just jump in the water. They're very, as you guys know, you've rescued quite a few yourself. They're very sweet, they're very goofy. As long as they're in shallow water, they feel like you have all the power. So I can basically manhandle a thousand pound fish as long as, I'm not above my head. If they're in deep water and they're not cold stunned, game over. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the end of you, unless you can put in, in something like our modified hula hoop. So here I am off a of born with a fish waiting to get picked up by a fisherman. We meet a lot of great people when we're out there asking for rides so they can help us tow the fish into deeper water. And this is one of our interns from last year. He had one of the biggest fish we were trying to rescue. These are our hula hoops and they're basically hula hoops with pool noodles. This is as much as we, I mean, it's pretty pathetic, but this is what we're using. And you can see the hula hoop doesn't even go all the way under the fish. So Garrett didn't know what to do with this fish. It was so big. He basically just shoved the nose, the rostrum in the hula hoop and strapped him in, then got back in his kayak and kept bringing him out into deeper water. So they can be all sizes from 100 pounds to over. I think the heaviest one we tried to weigh was 1,400 pounds and she was breaking our scale. So we had to stop away. So we will jump in the water with them. They won't hurt you. Here we are on the left in Wellfleet Harbor. We're just 
walking this fish out of Wellfleet Harbor. This is before they dredged. And so much of the harbor was very shallow. And in the other side on the right, we had to basically, this is behind the Wellfleet Pier, get in the water with the fish because it kept trying to turn around. They get very confused. And so now we're in the water with it, just directing it all the way around the pier and then as far out as we can. That anal fin, as soon as that bottom fin hits the bottom, they panic. And even though they might be going in the right direction, they'll turn right around them. So it's really good to be with them somehow in a boat, a kayak, something, and just keep pushing them in the right direction. But they really can't hurt you. Here's Amy. She's kayaking one out around the pier. And so this one was a very easy one. Uh, and so she just got behind it and just kept nudging it around the pier, heading in the right direction. We always like those animals that are very cooperative and help us out. And then here, uh, somebody sent a drone up and we are doing a tandem kayak. And so we have two kayaks attached. We have the hula hoop. We had this fish in shallow water, jumped in the water, strapped the fish in the hula hoop. It's a big fish. You can see the hula hoop just basically covers the head, but the head is the heaviest part of the animal. And we're just kayaking frantically to get this animal out of shallow water. We would like that too. Yeah, well, we do. <laughs> Pretty funny. It's a good time. <laughs> yeah, we kind of coordinated. Yeah, so it's it was kind of fun. Uh, somebody yeah. sent a drone up, and you hear that, and you're just like, oh, just come down and help us. <laughs> but then when they send you the material, it's very helpful. So we work with a lot of fishermen who take pity on our souls. And this is Bruce. He fishes in Bourne, and he saw us trying to rescue this small ocean sunfish that was in Little Buttermilk Bay, and uh, basically got him tied up to the boat. And have to tow slow because you're just basically, you know, have this fish on the side of the boat. It's making it hard for the boat to maneuver, and the fish is just getting dragged. And you don't want to put too much water through the mouth. And then here we are towing a fish on the hula hoop. If you can keep them on the side and behind the boat, I think you can do a better job and go faster. But you still have to be careful with the hula hoop because you don't, you know, you have to keep the fish submerged because they can pump water in the mouth. So you're towing something that's submerged, five, 600 pounds, and you can't tow very fast because you don't want to hurt the fish. And so it makes it very hard because it's really hard for people to give you uh, one or two hours of tow time. You know, how long is this going to take? Oh, at two and a half miles, it's going to take us quite a long time to get this thing out of Wellfleet Harbor. But, you know, it, it we're, we're evolving. We're getting there, I hope. So we have lots of ideas, lots of gear. We have a couple hula hoops because we'll have up to eight or 10 fish weaseling into Wellfleet Harbor at the same time. They get to the, they get to the uh, pier and they're like, what? What happened? What do I do now? So we're all running around trying to grab the fish before they strand. We brought our uh, our um, sling, our tow sling, so you to look at it. And what I'd really like to make is something a little bit more towable, where you can have an aluminum ring and a, a basically a, a a tow bar, and then put the animal in it on its side, like we do with the noodle, with some flotation, and just tow behind the boat as quickly as you can make everybody's life a lot easier. So here is the rescue that we did with Blair and um, uh, Scott Leonard. And I forgot your crew member's name. Dan. Dan. And you had a fish stuck all the way up in the back on the east of Nantucket Harbor. And it was going to be a very long time for us to tow it on the side of the boat. So we caught the animal. That was the easy part. Dan and I jumped in the water. Blair used the boat and pushed the fish towards the land in shallow water so we could maneuver and uh, grab the animal easily. We got the animal in the sling next to the side of the boat, but then it was going to take two hours, two and a half hours yeah. or more to tow this fish out to the mouth. And, and that's why we were looking at this little spit of land going, oh, oh, oh do we know anybody <laughs> who can come with a four wheel drive and just drag them on the other side? So what Blair thought of, which was beautiful, is that we had a very heavy toe strap, which was really supporting the weight of the fish. It wasn't the sling. The sling was just kind of keeping the fish in one spot. 
And so we picked the fish up, put it on the boat. Blair had a whole pack of uh, brand new life jackets, which I probably think you probably never used again <laughs> after all the slime <laughs> from that fish. And then Dan had the saltwater hose and we were just throwing water in the mouth. And now Blair could just, you know, run. He could run as fast as he needed to. And we got to the mouth of the harbor in 20 minutes. Yeah, probably not even 15. And then we picked him up, put him back in the water, and off he went. It was a wonderful rescue. And there you can see, you can see the life jackets. We are hanging on for dear life with this fish. Blair <laughs> is cruising. And uh, such a promoter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Here we are. And it was a great rescue. It was wonderful. So one of the problems is if you lose the water underneath the animal, then it's you and that dead weight. So you and 500 pounds, no longer are they easy peasy to move. Uh, it's really difficult. And we lost this fish and you can see the deep water. And this is the channel between Little Buttermilk and Big Buttermilk and Bourne is less than 20 feet away. But we couldn't move this fish. We tried to dig under her, everything, and she died on us, which was very sad. So one of the things I'm trying to think of are ways that we can use physics and engineering to help us move these big animals. So, and, and ocean sunfish don't roll. It's not like a dolphin where you could, I mean, they are flat as a pancake. And so if you were to have a cart and with the big beach wheels and you have a little ramp and you get under that clavis and then you have two hooks that are on that, those fins, and then you have some kind of mechanical device like a, a crane scale or something, you know, or um, a winch, and you pull the fish up onto the bed of your beach cart, and then you just push them into the water. So I've got lots of ideas. I just don't have the ability to make this kind of stuff. Now, here is your rescue that you did a week ago, couple two weeks ago, a couple weeks, weeks ago. So this fish was stuck in the harbor. Mm -hmm. And you guys uh, did an incredible rescue where you used Blair's truck. And I only have just one video here because Rain sent me a lot of them, but I have so many videos. So I was like, I'm going to totally crash my program. But she basically sent the, a number of videos. And this one I like a lot because it shows you the truck backing into the ocean. Now they picked up the fish. They basically did what you're going to see in reverse. Somebody had the fish in shallow water. Blair backed his truck down into the water. He has a lift. He lowered the lift. They basically floated the fish onto the lift, pulled the lift up, and then Rain, and who else was in the back of the truck? It was a stranger. It was a civilian. I, it was Eric. That's all I know. <laughs> I don't know. Pumping water in yeah. over the gills and in the mouth to keep the fish alive. It took you 15 minutes to get 12 minutes. 12. 12, you were timing. Oh, yeah. 12 minutes to get to the other side. And then this is where they're releasing. So this is a great video. And this is wonderful. I mean, this is what this fish needed. Forget about mucking around with the boat. Forget about all of this stuff. Just pick them up and put them on the other side and let them go. Now, the only thing I was just suggesting to Blair is if you had a strap, so I brought you some straps, but a strap around that fish as he pulled off would have made his life so much easier. So there's a lot of you know easy things you can do. And we brought you kits, data sheets, and straps. And when you're in the bed of the truck next time, oh, yeah. um, okay, in a bucket of water, right? Okay, so we're gonna get y'all set up. Now, when they get really mad at you, they <laughs> spit. So uh, we've you know had them spitting at us, and we're just like you know suck it up. We're trying to help you <laughs> get with the program. But really, they can't do anything. They can close the mouth. You stick your hand in the mouth, they'll close down on it slowly. They can't snap, but they're not trying to, you know, hurt you. But they'll get mad. And the other thing they'll do is when they get mad at you, they'll go right to the bottom. They'll lie in the on the ocean floor and they'll look at you. <laughs> and you'll be in the kayak going, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? <laughs> the tide's going out. And then you take your kayak paddle. Mud, mud, chink. Uh, chink, chink, uh. and you just reach down there and you pull them up and you're like, come on, buddy, we got to go. So if they're really funny, I mean, I don't know if that's smart or not smart, but I, I think that's quite creative where they just go right to the bottom and try to wait you out. So it's kind of fun. Now, if they wash up dead, it's very sad. Or if we can't save the animal, then as good marine biologists, we switch gears. 
And so we're trying to use each carcass as a way of helping us gain information, data, tissues, things like that, that we can share with other people to try to learn more about this animal. Since there's no money in this, we all do it like Marine Mammal Alliance. We all do it for free. And so, you know, there's no research really being conducted on it. So we're supplying researchers with data and tissues and other information. And so we do it right on the beach. People are like, oh, you're taking that to your lab. <laughs> oh, I'm not picking that thing up. No, we are working right where we are. Day, night, good weather, bad weather. Coyotes howling in the background. You know, whatever. We're there to try to get that information. And the carcasses will reflow. So when you've got a carcass on the beach, you got to deal with it right then and there. So they're floatable. Peter, here's the aluminum tripod. And this one can take a lot more weight. But it's a uh, you know little it's it's taller and heavier. Right. So you know when you have to transport gear to the animal, you have to sit there and make those kinds of decisions. Which should I bring the wooden tripod or the aluminum and stuff like that? So tagging a carcass is really important. As I mentioned before, we can't figure out a way to safely tag a live fish, and we need to. We need to know whether or not what we're doing is making any sense. But the carcasses we have to tag because they float away. And here's a prime example. This carcass came into harm's way in East Ham on a uh, Wednesday. On Thursday, somebody photographed the animal with a tag. So they got the tag number uh, 5.7 miles away at Skakit Beach. On the next day, it floated back 5.7 miles and it landed 100 feet from where it, re it originally landed. And so when they flip over, if they float away, they start to lose the color of the gray skin, they turn white. This, this makes me worried because we don't want to overcount. We don't want to say, oh my God, thousands of ocean sunfish are stranding when it's the same carcass that just keeps floating <laughs> around. So it's not easy to, um, if I can just hit this, to uh, tag a carcass. I mean, they have a lot of supports on those dorsal fins and anal fins. So you, we have six inch knives, which I have for you. You have to put some muscle in there. And unfortunately, we're putting a little plastic in the ocean. We've tried lots of different things to try to tag these animals with um, biodegradable materials, but nothing's working. So we put cable ties on the fins, different colors, and then we kind of color code them. And that way, if the animal flips or if it starts to degrade, we know exactly who that animal is. Now, this animal is so weird. I, again, I'm a whale biologist. I am not a, a fisheries biologist. They have very rough skin. We have some skin for you to look at, but they have a thick layer of reticulated collagen right under the skin. And as a whale biologist, it reminds me of blubber, how blubber surrounds a whale and keeps the internal organs and body warm. Well, this stuff is not malleable like blubber. It's hard as rock. And yeah, Peter knows, Peter and Kim know, and Rain and Blair know. It, you want to get into that fish to sex it. There are no external features that we have found or anyone has found to sex an ocean sunfish. If it's dead, you got to open it up and find the gonad, see if it's a testier or an ovary. But in this case, if you want to get in there to look at anything, you got to put some muscle in it. And it's a, quite a workout. So I thought originally when this was happening, we started the sighting network in 2007. 2008 started getting phone calls about stranded ocean sunfish. We thought it was, you know, misnomer, something's going on, no big deal. 2009, we almost had 20. We responded to 20 carcasses or live animals. 2010, over 25. 2011, 30. 2012, almost 40. So we're like, okay, something's, something's wrong here. Obviously, people know there's crazy people in the world who will drop everything and run down to the Cape and try to rescue or necropsy an ocean sunfish. <laughs> You're all crazy. You're my friend. You're my friend. So we thought, okay, people know who to call. So that's one of the reasons we see this general increase. But then 2013, boom, numbers came way down and then they're starting to go way back up. In 2019, we almost had 160 documented animals hitting the beach dead and alive. And I didn't even want to answer my phone anymore. I was just like, I can't do it. So it's been crazy. And we've been rescuing a lot of fish. And I think that's one of the reasons that the numbers are going down. What's really interesting is the big year for the sea turtles, where we had over 1,400 sea turtles strand, 2014. 
but it wasn't a big year for us. Thank goodness. I don't think we could have dealt with both things happening at the same time. So I've done a little analysis looking at water temperature, this and that. A lot of this pattern is going with water, surface water temperature. Exactly what's going on, I don't know. I'm not, you know, that smart to figure that out. But there is something going on, and it makes sense. Warmer waters, as you know, we're dealing with climate change and the warming oceans, and the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than any other body of water. It's going to attract more of these animals close to shore feeding. More animals close to the Cape or inside Cape Cod Bay means higher number of stranded animals when the stranding season comes. So that makes sense. So here is the typical stranding areas. We've got a couple on Nantucket. We have a couple every year uh, on Martha's Vineyard. Sometimes they can almost make it through the canal. We have them on the east end of the Cape Cod Canal and on the west end. You can see that the hooks tend to be the hot spots. And if you look deep inside Wellfleet Harbor, 70% of our strandings are in Wellfleet because of the trap there. And this is the one sharp-tailed mola, more of a tropical species that stranded way up in Wellfleet Harbor. So that was pretty cool. You never know what you're going to find. So level A, we'll get daytime general location. We'll get some weights if we can, skin samples, parasites. Uh, again, we're bringing all the gear there. We take lots of photos for photo ID, try to document what's going on with the animals. And then we came up with our own way of measuring them because I couldn't find any measurement scheme online. So in the early years, we took a lot more measurements than we do now. A lot of these body measurements, some of them are historic measurements, others are not. And we're going now mainly to straight line measurements. We record the presence or absence of parasites because after about an hour or so after the animal strands, the parasites realize something's wrong and they bail. So if you see parasites, it's an indication that you have a fresh carcass. That's one of the indications. And then we'll try to weigh them with our portable weighing tripods to try to get some kind of a weight estimate for each size. If the animal's fresh, we have time, everything's working out in our favor, then we'll do more in-depth necropsy and we collect tons of tissue for our research and we support research of other people in the United States and worldwide. And then, you know, this reticulated collagen stuff is just crazy and very thick, but the collagen varies in depth over the course of the animal. And so it's really hard to know how to measure this because it's not a, you know, a standard depth around the animal's body. We have to open them up and you have to go up into the anal vent and get there before the vultures, the turkey vultures and the gulls get there because they'll pull out the gonad and then there is no hope of sexing this animal. So they have one ovary and one testy, which is, uh, it's got a septum. So it's still considered, I think, one testy. And then I took one of the diagrams, you know, photographs that we had taken, and I made some diagrams, and they have um, all the things that you would normally expect, except for they do not have an air bladder. So like basking sharks, no air bladder. If you're a fish without an air bladder that you can use to change your position in the water column, you typically have a very big and very oily liver, and they do. And so they have these four and a half gills, they have a huge liver, they have a bladder, they hold their urine, but not there. What's going on here? You're a fish in the ocean. Just pee where you want to be. <laughs> but obviously it has something to do with osmotic regulation and control. So it's kind of interesting and a big eye. And they have these pharyngeal gill teeth high up in the throat that are the hardest part of this fish. These spines, we I believe are used to shred and to direct the jellyfish down into the back of the throat and in the stomach and we take out the whole digestive tract, we measure it, we open it up. There's a couple different sections in there that we measure and we look for any kind of food, squid beaks, otoliths, fish otoliths, anything we can help us determine what these animals might be eating. And then here's Bob Prescott, just retired from Mass Audubon. All the parasites, we collect parasites for the researchers, but they have the highest number of parasites in and out of the body. Now, I thought, because I don't know anything, I'm a whale biologist, you know, I did a little fisheries work in college, ocean sunfish, heaviest bony fish. All right. So there, you know, we'll have these otoliths. I know with cod and haddock, you kill the cod or haddock, you open the skull, and you grab these calcified little structures that you can section. And when you section the otoliths of cod or haddock, you see this light dark banding pattern 
And that can give you a feel for how old the cod is. So I thought ocean sunfish. They're huge. They'll have these pancake size otoliths. Nope. They have these tiny, tiny little otoliths the size of a dry lentil. And when you <laughs> section them, they're grainy. There is no information there and using the standard technique. So what is plan B? Plan B, maybe, even though their bones are more cartilaginous than anything else, they're not cartilage. They just have a lot of spongy material in them. So even though this is the heaviest bony fish, you can cut through every part of this fish. Here's a section from the skull to the 12th vertebra. So then we started taking sections of vertebra. I would take them back to the lab, clean them by hand, disarticulate them, take measurements. And now we have researchers up in Gloucester who are trying to age them using the light and dark bandings in the center of the vertebra, the centrums, to see if maybe that can be used. We've looked at every part of this fish, teeth, um, eyes, we're looking at eyes, vertebra, the spines, the supports in the uh, pectoral fin, anything we can think of, and no one has been able to figure out how to age this fish. So here's another animal that we've included, the basking shark, like the ocean sunfish, very cosmopolitan, coastal species, spending many months in the high latitudes in the spring, summer, and fall, heading south in the winter. Don't know much about this animal. Maybe they live to 50 years. Maybe they mature within six to 13 years. They are protected. They have more protection than an ocean sunfish. Uh, they are listed as endangered and numbers are increasing worldwide. Also a very handsome fish. Makes you wonder exactly what's going on here as that beautiful nose, Centaurinus maximus, big nose sea monster, uh, as it comes towards you, has a lot of sensors on it. And here you can see this animal probably got caught in some kind of fishing gear. So they are a gorgeous <laughs> animal and they're a filter feeder and they're gonna filter copepods out of the water. So just like the North Atlantic right whale, this big animal is filtering something the size of a grain of rice and making a living on doing that. But again, if you can filter closer to the base of the food chain, you can get more energy per volume. So every time you ate a fish, who ate a smaller fish, who ate a smaller fish, who ate the plankton, you lose energy in the transfer. So get rid of the middle guy, go right for the goal. And even if you're a big animal, you can do well. And so on that last one, you can see from aerial surveys, Basking sharks can travel alone like ocean sunfish or together. And then if they're feeding, you can see that they'll feed like right whales in an echelon behavior, one behind the other or one alongside the other. And this is what they're going for, copepods. From an aerial perspective, it looks like blood in the water because these copepods have a little uh, stain of a dye inside them, but they're really tiny. And to look at them under the microscope, very cute. But this is what basking sharks, which can be up to 20, 30, 40 feet in length, are filtering out of the water. It's just amazing. And so it's Mother Nature's plankton net. Just like a plankton net, make your mouth nice and big. Just go nice and slow through the plankton patch. Water and plankton come into the mouth and throat. Water flows over the gills. Plankton gets caught on the gill rakers. So it's really an interesting way of making a living. <clears throat> and then here's a great video we took. We were off of Green Harbor in Massachusetts and we had basking shark. And so we got up onto it and we had a GoPro and it's really, it's long, I didn't cut it down. It's just a long video, but you're gonna see this animal not bothered by the boat. It's probably a 25 foot boat coming right alongside it. It's close to the surface. You can see that nice big dorsal fin. You're gonna maybe see the second dorsal fin and you're gonna see the tail every once in a while. You can see how murky the water is, how productive it is. This animal's got its mouth wide open. Water and plankton, copepods are coming into the mouth. Water's going over the gills. You can see the red bloody uh, blood vessel gills there going out of the body. And then the, I love this. Mm -hmm. Then the uh, copepods are getting caught on gill rakers, these fibrous structures that will then push it down. Look at that, right down into the mouth. <laughs> yum, yum, yum. Oh, look at him. Yours is so good. <laughs> <laughs> That's just incredible. And then off he goes. Just incredible. I love that video. And so you'll see a lot of different behaviors circling behavior, following behavior, 
And they do strand, unlike ocean sunfish, which can ventilate by using the tongue to pump water up and down if they get stuck on a sandbar, but they're covered with water, they can survive until the tide comes back up. Basking sharks cannot pump water over the gills. So if they get stuck in fishing gear or they get stuck on a sandbar, they, even though they're surrounded by water, they will die. And there was a situation in 2010, two basking sharks were off of Whitehorse Beach for a day or so feeding back and forth. Everybody was watching them, it was great. The next morning they came back, one had accidentally stranded on a sand flat that night and died and they did a necropsy, the state did a necropsy the next day. Another fish that we picked up because we don't know much about them, but we see them stranded on our beaches are the torpedo ray. And we just had a, a young girl rescue a torpedo ray today in Dennis, and she put it in her turtle sled and dragged it a, half, a quarter mile back out over the flats into deep water. She's amazing. I haven't met her, but um, she's just an incredible person. Got to be a little, a little uh, careful with torpedo rays because they're the only electric ray. So you have to know where to grab them and where not to grab them. But they are found along our coast all the way down to Venezuela. And they are um, they do a live egg birth. We don't know much about where they mate, where they birth, their gestation period. All we know from IUCN international evaluation is that their numbers are decreasing. And it's really hard to get any video of these animals. I put the word out on Facebook. Thank goodness for Facebook. And a uh, diver sent me these videos from Massachusetts, which are really gorgeous because we're always dealing with the animal when it's stranded. And this is a really beautiful video to see the animal in the water. They don't know much about them. They don't know if they're benthic, demersal. They don't know where they spend a lot of their time. They don't know if they head south. Here's another nighttime video. And they, but they have a bit of an attitude. If you look online, there are some videos where the scuba diver goes towards the animal kind of in front of it and the torpedo ray doesn't like it and turns around and just starts you know coming after the scuba diver and it's like I think you need to rethink this because you don't want to get shocked by this animal. And you can see this is a male. You can see the claspers, those extensions to the fins coming through. So it's kind of nice to be able to sex something without having to open it up. They are said to hide under the sand and then shock fish or anything that might be above them. They're said to eat mainly fish, but again, we don't really know much about them. And so when we have a dead one, we'll open them up. To sex them is very easy. The females tend to be larger. They do not have those claspers. The males have the claspers that they use to help direct the sperm into the female when they're uh, reproducing. This is the electric organ. It's in the side of the head on either side. It can produce a 220 volt shock. You don't want to grab the torpedo ray at any time because then you create a circuit and you're going to get kicked on your butt and it can create some electrical problems with your heart. So when you're trying to rescue them, you want to get something soft around the tail and work that way. So it's an amazing tissue. The tissue looks, reminds me of um, AA batteries. You know, how they're using this modified muscle tissue to create that kind of voltage is just incredible. So here's a torpedo ray. This is what happened today. Uh, this was in Brewster. The torpedo ray that stranded was in Dennis, but you can see the problem when the tide goes out in some of these Cape towns, you have miles of sand flats. And there's no way this animal is going to survive. So what we did is we put it on a tarp and then we dragged it a half a mile out back into the water and then out to try to get it to where the water was deeper, hoping that when the tide came up, the animal was going to be okay. We went back to the beach in Brewster three, three days in a row. We never found the carcass. So here's really kind of cool. They have green yolk. Their eggs have green yolk and no one has been able to tell me why. So the females will have these huge eggs with green yolk. They have a huge liver on either side. They have a spiral intestine like many of the sharks. 
They have a uterus because the eggs are going to develop inside the mother. They have a heart, two-chambered heart, but I think there's probably uh, more sinuses there that assist. We open up the stomach to see what they ate. And most of the time, we're finding these kinds of fish. But last year, we found a diving duck. A long-tailed duck was in a female. When we open the stomach, complete duck. Obviously, this female, uh, torpedo ray, had met the duck somewhere in mid-depth grabbed it, shocked it, and swallowed it whole. So it's really important this kind of work to try to document what these animals are eating. I sent this information to John Chisholm and this, this duck was, this carcass was way out on P-Town on Long Point. If you've ever walked to Long Point, you have to walk the mile breakwater at the West End. And I always fall on that breakwater. And so we had gotten back, I probably fell that day. And everything was great. I called John, I told him what we had and he's like, can you go get the duck? <laughs> I'm like, oh, yes, we can do it. Drive all the way back down and walk that breakwater and we found the duck. So it was pretty interesting. So here are the strandings for torpedo rays in 2020. Again, the hot spots are the shallow areas where you have a lot of tidal flats when the tide goes out, Wellfleet and Long Point. In fact, Long Point, the inside of Long Point is a hot spot for torpedo uh, strandings. And so we have worked up a worksheet. We've created a worksheet. We have free worksheets for you, data sheets. We take measurements, weights, do everything we can do to think of data that other people might want to better understand the species. We have our two weighing systems. We have a pole that we can put a scale on. We brought that with us to show you. And we can weigh small things up to 600 pounds as long as the pole doesn't break. And then we have our tripods that will uh, use to weigh heavier items. But again, easier to take the pole across the mile long breakwater than it is to think about even carrying that tripod. And so it's all a community effort. This was a group of uh, AmeriCorps students. Somehow they found me, I don't even know who they were, but they showed up one day and they were like, oh, you've got a dead ocean sunfish, we wanna help. And I'm like, great. So take your shoes off. This was probably October. Take your shoes off, get in the water. I was giving them all my clothes, my sweater, my jacket. They were not prepared. <laughs> and everybody wanted to do something in terms of the necropsies. I was running out of knives. But it really is a community event because there's no way that we can be where we need to be every day, every second, every time. And so by working with other nonprofits and organizations, we can actually do a better job and understand these animals a lot more. So we always provide free gear and supplies. If someone's going to volunteer their time to open up a stinky fish, I think it's important to make sure that they have all the gear they need and not to ask them to buy anything. And we do infield training. So hopefully someday I'll be able to come over. And if you have a dead ocean sunfish, God forbid, we'll be able to work together. and We can take the whole animal apart and I can tell you everything that I know. So we do everything on site and we have shared materials on our private Google Drive where we have training materials, videos and diagrams. And we already saw that one. We have plaques to put in people's cars so they don't get towed when they're parked in the wrong spot trying to get to an animal. I brought you some stranding cards which have a scale, black and white scale, that is important if you're taking photos. We keep in touch with the WhatsApp. Oh, I spelled it wrong. With WhatsApp. And so we have chat groups where um, we're taking photos, GPS positions, sharing all of that information, trying to keep the group connected even if people can't join us on that day. We use my GPS coordinates. I don't even take my garments out anymore. This app for your phone is very good at getting a position for you. And then we take a screenshot, so that goes with your photos. And then back at the lab or at my house, we work up all the tissues, we subsample, label. Much of the tissue is given to researchers all over the world. And it's incredible. This is an ovary and that is an ovary. So that shows you the spread and size that we can find for sizes of fish and for organs. So I had both of those um, together. So I thought I'd be nice to take a picture. We gave over 300 samples of muscle DNA tissue to Northeastern for their genome legacy project. We are working with Dr. John Logan, Inga Potter, Kara Dodge, and looking at mucus, muscle, and liver 
doing isotope work to figure out toxin exposure and diet. We are working with Dr. Rich McBride down at Woods Hole Age and Growth Lab. And the only thing that he can do right now, because they cannot figure out how to age this animal, is they're looking at the gonads and they're trying to see if they can at least analyze the tissue, do histology, look at the cell structure, and determine what, a, what level of reproductive capabilities they're at. One of the simple things he's done so far is just take our data on total length of the animal, the carcass, and plot it against the weight of the gonad. And as you would expect, as the carcass gets bigger in size, the gonad gets bigger in weight, heavier in weight, but then there's a certain length of fish where the size and the weight of the gonad just explodes. And he's thinking that this is where the animals are becoming sexually mature. And again, he can't tell us what age that is, but it's an interesting information. The last fish that we're picking up uh, last year and this year is the trigger fish. <laughs> no, no. And so we've been noticing and walking by lots of trigger fish. Now we had 40 last year. And we're almost up to 40 this year. We don't know why they're stranding. Last year, they were this big. This year, they're this big. So we're like, what is going on? And so I don't have time because this is getting too long of a talk anyway, but we have data sheets now when we take measurements and stuff. The one, and I brought a trigger fish for us to work on. The one thing that I can't do with the trigger fish is I can't sex it. So maybe Blair, you can help me. I have opened up so many and I just, I can't find the gonad, I'm going nuts. So, and they're hard to open up. I thought the ocean sunfish was hard to open up. These guys, their skin is like leather. They're actually, one of their common names is the leather jacket. Now I know why. That they're so cute. But thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. So you guys have any questions? So WhatsApp. Um you just what's the number for the WhatsApp chat? Or is that kind of a closed group for you? So it, yeah, so it's a private group. And so anybody who wants to be on it has to have if you start a group, you have to have WhatsApp on your phone. And then I have to have you in my contacts, and then I invite you. And then you can see all the chit chat. You can't see previous chit chat, but you will see everything going forward. And it's really great because like I said, it keeps us connected. It keeps everybody in the know what's going on. It helps, you know, like I've got this dead bird, what is it? And then somebody who's got more bird experience will be able to figure it out. Or, you know, it's really helps to, you know, get that expertise in there from all different sources. The problem with it is that there's a lot of chit chat <laughs> and a lot of people are like, done with that, you know, so we're always trying to encourage people, you know, we've got some people who are really good, you know, cheerleaders, good job, that was great, this and that, but then that just, you know, you go, you go home and you'll have what, 80, 80, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90. Yeah. you're like, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm just not doing it, you know, so it's got its pluses and minuses, but it's free. And it's easy. You can share videos, photos, positions. Um, it does it's, save everything to your phone, though. You will have all of the photos on your phone. Then. And then you have to delete. Yeah. Speaking of photos, the other thing uh, is uh, a uh, app that I really like. It's called Soul Locator because you take a picture and it has the GPS coordinates right on. Oh, yeah. yeah it labels too. Good. That's that too. Because you can label yeah, yeah. Or you can that too. Uh, oh, yeah, the teacher. That's so like what that accurate. Oh, I don't think it was that accurate. Yeah, I yeah. thought it was way off. Yeah. True. And water markets too. Date, line, and you type in whatever. Whatever it is. Yeah. 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 See, this is the technology that I am not <laughs> too old for. This, but I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's really important. And I'm always trying to train people as long as you get some basic bits of information. Date, time, general location, phrase point, GPS position, 41 point, blah, 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 minus 70 point, blah, 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 photos, maybe some background photos with whatever you're photographing and what's behind it, the house is here, the telephone poles there, this or that. If you can get those four or five bits of information, you have pretty much everything anyone's going to need. If, you know, if, you, if somebody says, oh, that's, you know, Greg Scoble, he needs that information. You've got it. You've got what he needs. And then usually when you take a picture, you want to have some kind of a scale in the in the photo. But to get into the habit to train people to take that kind of information, not hard, doesn't take a lot of time. But boy, 
you can plot things, you can share things, you can evaluate things, you can zoom in and see if there's parasites, you can, you know, check out for claspers or non-claspers. It's really important. So we're going to check that one out. I like that. Yeah. Anything else? We've got a lot of stuff for you guys. We've got free, I got two kits. So I figure you guys will take one and then either the field station or uh, somebody else take the other. I've got one. I've got knives with protector. Nobody gets hurt. These are great. These little things for mucus on a very windy day. Nice way to have one of these uh, metal tape measures, metric, so that the wind doesn't take it. But then we have the other one. If you're tagging something, scissors, pens, permanent pens. I've got the photo card. I've got a small strap, which is always nice to carry. You never know if you need it. I've got a bunch of little plastic containers. I've got a second knife. I've got a knife sharpener. I've got our necro tabs, which had a number on it that we put into the fins. I've got some really nice big um, plastic bags and little bag. And then I'm starting to use this plastic scale, which is nice and easy and light to measure smaller fish. So this is like fish board, which is nice. You open this up. And that's nice to carry. Sometimes we put stuff in our backpacks because we're walking um, and it's just easier to do that. And then lots of times we just leave stuff in our car. But this is all two kits for you guys. And then we have the three baby sheets, about 15 of each. And then we have straps, a strap for a big strap for each one. It's nice to have a strap. I mean, one of those, lots of brochures and stuff. And then we can show you how we set up the um, torpedo ray scale and the tripod, if you're interested. We could do it right inside or outside. <laughs> well, it's ready. Well, we're just going to end the remote part. OK. Um, so thank you, everyone who's joined us remotely. There was one comment in the um, Q&A. It was in a question. It was a great job, Krill. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> From Nicole Downing. And um, no one else has has written in any. Um, did anyone here have a question about everything she went over? Um, that There's might a test. There's a quiz. <laughs> I hope you're paying attention. I just have a couple curiosity type comments and questions. So the cocoa pods that they eat, you showed the um, it was like a microscopic picture of it. They're much smaller because when we you can see them. Okay, because when we were doing one of the dissections, there was one that was about with a basking shark. Uh, no, the um, oh, the, the cocoa pod for the mola. That's it was, it was in the gill. It's in the gill. There was yeah. several that's a gill about this big. Yeah, that's a gill cocoa pod. White yeah. with a couple of dark and eyes. Pictures. And and what's interesting is that the first, the top piece, the lighter yellow piece. Yeah, that's the female, and she has these appendages where she sinks into the gill. Yeah, and then the other, the darker piece, that's the male. Oh, you're kidding. And he attaches to her to oh. mate. Oh wow! And quite often. That not always, but much of the time, you'll find those copepods. Those are calamarid copepods in the gills. Yeah. Of you know healthy fish. Everybody yeah. has parasites. Yeah. Um, but um, even after the, as you know, the carcass has been sitting for a couple of days, they're still alive. Yeah. 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 Kind of gross. Yeah, they are kind of gross. <laughs> kind of cool, but kind of gross. Could then, we use um. We have the same problem with uh, gray seals, perhaps washing up somewhere else, ones that are already dead. So we started using these uh, metal uh, cattle ear tags and they work great. They're very sharp. They go right through yeah. tongue yeah. material. Well, I've got, material yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, be interesting. We tried the oh, ear yeah. tags, but I think it was a plastic version of the cow ear yeah, tags. This, is a, this does, uh, this is kind of, I don't think it's aluminum, but it's some sort of steel. So it will rust out eventually, yeah. but you know, well after the animals decomposed. Well, that'd be interesting. It's just those fins are solid with these supports going through. Well, we've gone through the seal on the outside edge of our uh, and, and that's really hard too. Okay. I mean, it takes a little strength, but it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's the same strength as um, tagging when you use those uh, biopsy tags. It's, you know, it's the same requirement. You can do it. 
Okay. We'll, we'll try it. We'll yeah. try it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah try it. Yeah. Could you? That would be a good. Then I wouldn't have to buy one in case it didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Take, a dead, take a dead animal and just yeah. see. If you, I would, so we try to we try to tag towards the body of the animal towards the base of the fin because the fins will start deteriorating as you head down to the body. And then we try to go as deep into the fin as we can so that that tag stays on as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But that's, I don't know. I mean, we could try on either the anal or the dorsal fin too. Oh yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But you want to tag low. You probably would be able to tag with that at the tip. Yeah. Right? Right. But it's not that one. Or maybe the base, like on the edge. I don't see why not. You could try. It's a, but see, it's it's a it's stuff that's going to To try and out. That big, it's just a you know, three sided comes together. You'll see it in a minute. I would, lo I would love to know. It's a nice point way to go through. Yeah. Um, it doesn't open that far coming in. Like that. that much? Yeah. We'll try it. Yeah. The other comment I wanted to make is in terms of trying to determine the age of these fish, I mean, there's the size, obviously, but um, I've we've only done the one female and it was a large ovary and it was a pretty decent sized fish. But with that run of males that we had a couple of weeks ago, yeah. um, the smaller fish, the testes definitely looked different oh, yeah. than the bigger fish. Yeah. I mean, they they just looked like if you were to if exactly. you were to fathom a guess. Yeah, you guys did just, great. If you were just gonna guess, you wouldn't you would say that the smaller ones were definitely not mature sexual organs. And that they could just, that could be, and we we sliced them too, and they just look different on the inside. On the inside, and the tissue pictures. Oh, so these uh, clip right in, like Ooh. that. Yeah. Very very sharp. Yeah. You want to tag your trigger fish? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, no, that's it's beautiful. beautiful. If we can switch from plastic to metal, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Let me take the bag right out of there. You have a couple other questions. So Chris Carcat is from Lexington and his class is tuning into this. And he's curious to know um, if you send kits to high schools courses. Or, and that's something perhaps yeah. an can email contact, yeah yep yeah. Yeah. yeah we try to send kits where people are okay. actually going to use yeah. them so yeah that round because you know it's a, a lot of money and just snaps. you know yep. so I yes and no the um other question was do the bodies uh sting after the fish are dead of the election yeah. no right once they're dead that's it that's yeah thank goodness so thank you everyone who tuned in remotely we're going to um to wrap up.